Hey, 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 closet busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, bold move expert and coming out coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. Hey, 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 Life Uncloseted listeners, followers, everybody that's a big fan. Okay, well, maybe not such a big fan, but anyway, you're here, you're listening, and I'm so excited to have you here. And you know what? Today we're going to take flight because sometimes, well, you just got to go flying out of those closets of your life to really step into being who you are completely. But sometimes that flight may take you to places that you never, ever imagined. It could be that you find yourself coming into a closet of minimalism. It could be you come out of a closet of sobriety and on top of everything else, it's all a big adventure. And sometimes when you find yourself in these spaces, you realize it all started when you were a little tiny, well, maybe not tiny boy, but a child. And you were so fascinated with flying that it became a part of your life. And as you moved further into your adult world and everything, you realized it was time to taxi down the runway and really let your life take flight. And today we're talking to a guy that I met through Instagram. We're both coaches, but we're both kind of helping people find those big, bold moves in their life to do the thing they're meant to do and really, truly step into the adventure of their life. And Nathan Seward, he is from, well, I guess down under on the other side of the world. It's morning where he is. It's afternoon where I am. And I'm just really excited to be talking to him today and how he got to this space in his life where he has truly taken flight to live life uncloseted. So welcome to the podcast again, sir. We tried to do this yesterday and we're trying it again today. So here we go. Yeah, so fast, so good. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, yeah. So... I'm excited about, you know, kind of this reboot we're having, right? <laughs> I try to make this work. So, um, <laughs> but let's, let's dive back in. So you, you have had a very interesting life and to the, what I alluded to about growing up and, you know, being this boy who was fascinated with flight, maybe that's a good place to kind of start. What was this whole thing that got you so curious about flying? Yeah, it's uh, it's always been a part of me. It's as long as I can remember. So it's probably one of those things that I've been into, uh, you know, before I can even have a memory of being into it. So the closest I can remember is, you know, my mum was from Canada. We lived in New Zealand. And so we flew to Canada a lot when I was a kid, mm-hmm. back and forth there. And so I was around airplanes and exposed to you know, international travel from a very young age. And I remember just having this fascination of, you know, seeing these pilots walking through the airport in LA or Honolulu and mm-hmm. just wondering, you know, what their life involved, where were they going, what were they getting up to? Right. And you know, I think that's where the seed was planted. Nice, nice. And I know I've always been fascinated by flight too, but I couldn't make it happen because my eyes weren't good enough and my spatial relations and all that stuff just were pitiful. But um I find it interesting that both of us have kind of find our way through life to like truly fly where we're supposed to be flying at this point. So eventually you did become a pilot, but between that, you know, becoming the pilot and little boy laying in the grass, checking out flights and everything, there were some other things that you started to fly through and suddenly began to realize to really take flight as yourself, you're going to have to step through some rather big challenges. And I know one of those challenges was as you were in high school and stuff, you had some special challenges, especially being at an all boys school. So how did that work for you, man? I mean, I know for me, (laughs) all boys school, I would have been like petrified, but I'm kind of wondering what your experience was there. Yeah, it was, it was was tough. I mean, uh, I went from like a very fun egalitarian elementary school and then went into a private all boys uh, high school, which Mm -hmm. It just felt like I was a little bit out of my depth. But, uh, yeah, it was quite a harsh environment, as you can imagine. And, yeah, then one day I remember sitting in church and in, in the chapel and then, you know, looking at this cute, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy across the mm-hmm. chapel and then, you know, same thing the next time and the same thing the next time. And then one day I woke up and went, oh, I think I know what this means. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, 
you know, that started a whole new uh, inquiry into what it would mean to be gay and live mm-hmm. my life that way. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was when I was 12 or 13. I didn't come out until I was 22. Okay. So it was probably a 10 year period there of struggling with my sexuality. Mm-hmm. No, I get that totally. And also, I just want to make sure that we all know he's de- definitely into the blonde haired, blue eyed ones. So there we <laughs> exactly. go, everybody. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I had a very similar experience because um, I went to an all an all Christian school. So it was a, you know, very much private school and everything. I went to through those all the way up through my um, second year of college. And it was in, I mean, I already was having those feelings about stuff. And I'm like, okay, is this who I am? What's going on? And then when I got to college, it became very apparent what was going on. And it was literally sitting in church one day. And I thought this, this isn't working. It just isn't working. And I did come out at 19 and then I went back in the closet, but most everybody's heard that story. So, but I just find the, the parallel so interesting because you just, you had this moment and then it was reality. So, um, so what I was, what it is about churches that, that I, I know it's gotta be the out. confessional or something. You know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> brings out yeah. the, well, the, wouldn't say the first, but the best in us. Uh, as yeah. people. But, um, so you move through high school, you get to that sp- Base and then when did the like okay I'm going to become a pilot when did that show up in your world was it in your time? oh man I mean that was that was right from you know I was a little kid so uh, I started flying I did my first flying lesson when I was 12 years old wow. like most, most people don't realize that you can do that but uh, I went solo when I was 16 years old I did my private pilot's license at 17 mm. and then you know it's, it's all I could really think about it was just as soon as high school finishes so I can just get through this so I can just tolerate mm. this period. Uh, I'll get into flying school and then I can really, you know, do what I want. And I kind of bet the house on it a little bit because my high school grades were pretty terrible. So I didn't really have any backup options. Right. So I knew that flying school was it. And if I couldn't make that work, then, you know, the whole thing would have been a disaster. But I left school when I was 17, dived right into flying school, and it was just everything I could have hoped for. I just found my people. I found freedom. I found what I love to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. That's awesome. I was I was talking to another girlfriend of mine earlier this week, actually recording a podcast with her. And um, before you and I had all the troubles with trying to <laughs> do this yesterday, <laughs> and um, she's got a new book um, coming out in April called Limitless. And there's four pillars within Limitless. And one of it is connection. The other one is um, really becoming consonant with who you are, like that full alignment. And as her and I were talking through it, it was amazing that I could start to see all these different things that if we really think about those four pillars of, you know, how do we get centered? It really can be put to anything we're doing in life. And it sounds like just as you said, it, as you were saying, you know, oh, I just knew it was a, I was going to be a pilot. I was going to do this. It sounds like that was the full alignment for you. It was truly where you knew you were aligned to be. Yeah. And, you know, these conversations so often is, you know, when you go back to childhood before the world kind of weighed you down, Mm -hmm. what were you into? Was it art? Was it dance? Was it sport? Was it public speaking? Uh, There's so many clues in childhood. And for me, I was lucky that the world didn't weigh me down. I Mm -hmm. knew what I wanted to do as a child. I knew I was born to fly. And I had a path, thankfully, for, you know, my parents helping me financially. I had a path to actually express that. You know, and I think this is the important piece. And when we start to see the path that we go and we take it and so many people, and I know you do a lot of work with people like, okay, let's go find this thing. Let's get you on that path. But oftentimes that path is very much in front of us, but yet we choose not to go engage it and, and follow it and, and take it. And I'm curious, as you're working with people as you see people like, okay, they want this path, but they're not going there. What's one of the big struggles that you see most people having? Because it's right there. Most of the time we can see it. We can feel it. We know where we're supposed to go, but we just won't go there. And I'm curious, what do you find when you're working with your clients that keeps them from doing that? Yeah. Well, you can see, you know, in my story, uh, as I tell it, I can see there's kind of three pieces to it. There's authenticity and there's a dream and then there's courage. And so the authenticity is the first piece around it is just being able to tell the truth, tell the truth that you're not happy in your, you know, with what you're doing. You're not happy with your life. There are places where you don't feel expressed. 
And mm. I think that's often the hardest part is just being honest with ourselves. Mm. So that's the first challenge is admit that maybe it's not, your life is not where you want it to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so and that I think, authenticity. And I think is, there's a piece yeah. there too that is the honesty is about giving yourself even permission to be honest. Sure. You know, it's like, okay, we, we know we can. And, you know, anytime we're in trouble, so to speak. So, you know, mom catches us with the hand in the cookie jar or whatever, you know, or somebody catches us looking at the blonde haired, blue eyed boy in church and we immediately <laughs> want to look away. Right. But I know as men coming out of the closet, the first thing we had to do was be honest with ourselves to really, truly like dive into that honesty. But even to get to there, we have to give ourselves permission to be honest with ourselves. I think it's one of the great blessings of being gay, mm -hmm. honestly, mm -hmm. is that a lot of people never come out of the closet. And that might be coming out of the closet as an artist or coming out of the closet as, uh, you know, wanting to go and be a stand-up comedian or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, most people never have that chance. Fortunately for us and you know, those of us that are out, we were kind of forced. We, we knew what our closet was yes. and we knew what we had to do to be authentic. And so in that way, it was a great blessing. In order to live a fulfilling, loving life, we had to confront something very early on. Right. Uh, so I think that's one of the great blessings of being gay. I agree a hundred percent. And some people would say, how can that be a blessing? You guys have gone through so much stuff. And I'm like, yes, but there's so much I've learned. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here on this podcast today if it hadn't been for my coming out. I don't believe I might, I might have, I, who knows? I may have gotten to podcasting somewhere along the way, but without coming out and then going, okay, this isn't what I want to be doing. I don't want to be doing what I was doing. I didn't want to be an executive doing branding, marketing, and then once I got laid off and then I got laid off again, I'm like, okay, I don't want to be doing this. I want to be doing my own thing. And um, it's, it's a tough one because yes, we could say it's too hard, but on the flip side, because of coming out, at least for me, I realized how many other things I was capable of coming out to go do mm. and open so many other doors. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm curious if that's kind of, I know there's a, a story we're working towards about, you know, you flew and all this stuff, but um, then there was that big change for you too, where you're like, okay, I'm kind of done with this chapter of my life. And do you think because of your coming out experience, that's what helped you decide you were done with the flying? Yeah. I mean, you, you said it beautifully. You realized that that was a gateway. That was a gateway to realize, Hey, you know, I can be authentic in different places. I, mm -hmm. I I've done this before. I've done something that, you know, coming out, it's like you potentially could lose your family. You could potentially mm -hmm. lose your friends. In some cases, you could lose your employment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what an incredible thing that is to say, I put authenticity in front of everything. Mm. And so I think that was the learning is knowing that, uh, you know, flying was an amazing career. I flew for uh, big airlines all around the world. I flew, um, yeah, one of the top airlines in the world and yep. was at the peak of my career and earning the biggest money and flying big airplanes. And it was amazing. Uh, but there was a part of me deep down that knew one, I wasn't making the kind of difference in the world that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And two, that I wasn't building something bigger. You know, when you park the airplane, you leave it and you go home and you don't think about it again. But I wanted to build something bigger, I, you know, whether it was a business or a movement or a mission, I wanted to be building something that was going to outlast me. And I knew that wasn't going to happen as long as I was flying. So that was the authenticity piece. And then what you're alluding to is then having the courage to go, well, you know, I, I've made this jump before. I, you know, I'm losing money. I'm losing income. I might lose some friends, but I know in my heart of hearts, my mind thinks I'm crazy, but in my heart, I know this is the right thing to do. My, my heart knows exactly that this is the right thing to do. And why, why was it so important for you? to go do something that was of it, making a difference and to build something bigger. Like what was really in it for you? I mean, I, I, we heard some of it, but I know for me, there's some deep seated stuff that came up for me when I did it. I'm curious, what was the real driver for you? Uh, well, honest truth is I don't know. Uh, my mm -hmm. brother asked me this last week, the same question. I thought, you know, I've never really thought about it. It's just, uh, you know, you know what you know. Uh, I guess, you know, like coming out as gay and, and going through those struggles at high school, I've always wanted to 
help people and mm-hmm. be there for people. And, uh, you know, in my family, there was a lot of suffering, you know, mm-hmm. and I've always been that, that person to want to help people with their suffering. Um, mm-hmm. So there's probably some seeds in it there, but sure. the truth is it's just what I felt I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's a good enough answer. If there's even any judgment to be put on this, you know, we get asked those questions a lot. I get asked that question a lot. It's like, okay, but why did, why do you do this? And, you know, I can come up with, you know, I love helping people and I love seeing what happens when somebody makes a big shift. But that's kind of like the stuff you just can hear, you know, when everybody <laughs> hear that feels that way. there's not many people that don't like helping people. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, I get in there and I start thinking about it. And my answer for me is if I didn't do this, I don't think I'd be worth being here. Mm. What's the point? Yeah. It's almost, it is kind of the, what the point, but it's not like, okay, if I wasn't doing this, I'd like off myself. No, it's not that. It's like, it's so ingrained in me to do these things that I'm doing, whether it's the podcast or writing books or writing articles or, you know, helping people come out of their closets, whatever that is. It's, as close as I can get without sounding, sounding super trite, it's my purpose. It's the reason I think I'm having this experience on the planet. And some days it's easy and some days it's not. But for me, it's, it's because I've been put here to do this and I'm only doing it the way I can do it. And those people who are going to work with me, they want me to be here to do it with them. So that's why I do this. If I wasn't here, yeah, there'd be somebody else who could do it. But for me, it's because I was put here to do this. And that doesn't come from ego. I guess I see it really clearly. I was here to do this. And if I wasn't doing this, I don't see what else I'd do because I've done a lot of other stuff <laughs> and it just didn't work. You know, it was like, ah, oh, no, that wasn't it. Nope. That wasn't it. And for the first time in my life, I realized I'm doing this because this is it. And is that a felt experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of self experience stuff that I know when I was in the midst of, coming out I thought I was the only gay man who'd ever been married and had kids on the planet (laughs) and I felt it really deep and at that time it was less prevalent that there were people out like that but then as soon as I came out the door and I started hanging out with you know other gay guys I'm like oh oh my god they're everywhere you know not as much as they are today but it was like suddenly I started seeing this wow I'm not the only one. And then that was kind of the light pole that started to hit for me was we all tend to think we're the only one until we start to find, Oh, here's another and here's another. And then you get in a bigger group and you, you know, it's always interesting to do some of those questions like, okay, who thinks? And then everybody raises their hand. It's like, Oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one who had that thought or that belief or that value or whatever it was. And I think for me, that was the big, one of the big light bulb moments is if I could have positive impact, hold space for someone who thinks they're the only one to help them see they're not, then my purpose is really well lived here. And that was a biggie for me. And it's a biggie every day, actually, quite honestly. But um, for you, it sounds like it's somewhat similar. Yeah, I was just present to, you know, one of my stories is that I don't belong, Mm. you know, and I'm always collecting evidence for where I don't belong. I walk into a room and I can find all the reasons why I don't belong in that room. Mm. Uh, And yeah, yes, I was just present to that while you were talking of, you know, realizing, well, you equally belong everywhere, Mm -hmm. all of us. Isn't that interesting how we don't feel like we belong? Mm. And, And it can be some of the stupidest little things. I mean, and some of them aren't stupid. We we think they're real. And for us, they are very real. Somebody else looks at them and I'm like, well, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> what do you mean you don't feel like you belong? And even as you were sharing that, I'm like, okay, I don't know Nathan that well. I mean, we've just been Instagram friends and stuff like that. But if I were to just first assess, I'm like, really? <laughs> you walk in a room and you don't think you belong? I'm like, you're a handsome guy. You're, you've accomplished. You do this. I'm like, really, I would actually feel somewhat intimidated if you walk in a room, but that's my story, which I think is what's so interesting is we each start to create these stories and none of them are really that true. 
Not a one of them. Yeah. You know, it's very, it's very fascinating. So what was the biggest surprise to you when you did walk away? And I'm going to say something folks, cause you didn't completely walk away, but when you walked away from flying as like a, a true, this is how I make my living, you know, this is what I go in and do it. What it was one of the biggest surprises that you found for yourself? Mm, I was surprised how leading up to it, you know, from the moment I resigned in a three month notice period. So mm -hmm. I had to go and fly for another three months and it was probably, you know, three to six months before that thinking about it. So it was probably like a you know, nine to 12 month process. And throughout that whole time, and especially near the end, the last month or two, I still wasn't sure if I was making the right decision, mm -hmm. but my mind wasn't sure. Right. So uh, I kept, you know, think, oh man, I don't think I've saved enough money. What if this is not going to work? What if, you know, all my friends have been pilots. So what if I don't have anything to relate to my friends and uh, you know, just in a real panic leading up mm -hmm. to it. Like I'm talking like full anxiety attacks, you know, in the weeks mm -hmm. prior, just going, wow, this is, this is crazy. And then a week after I felt fine. <laughs> There's no anxiety. There was no fear. <laughs> there was just this blank sheet of paper in front of me and just a tremendous amount of excitement. And so the biggest mm -hmm. surprise was like how quickly, like how much resistance there was and how challenging and how much courage it took to leave. And the next day after I'd actually left, how all of that dissipated. You know, that's so interesting because one of the things that I often will say to a client who's in, you know, a lot of people who are working through fear is the fear is only the fear until you walk through it. As soon as you walk up to it and we'll pass through it, it's done. It, 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 we create, it's almost like it's so much bigger until we actually do it. And as soon as it's done, that fear is like, okay, it's gone. We did it, you know? And okay. You can't say that when you maybe are standing in front of a, you know, a lion or a tiger out <laughs> you know, in the middle of <laughs> Africa and you're like, okay, I'm just going to walk through it. And you know, okay, then you are done guy because you know, probably you won't survive, but, it's always just this fascinating thing that I find when I throw that to somebody and go, okay, so here's the fear. It's right there. But the fear is I'm going to walk away from this beautiful income that's flying all over the world and everything. And it's scared. It's giving me anxiety. But the day you walked away from it the next day, it's like, uh, okay, I guess we're done with that fear. So to speak, <laughs> it's over with because it yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Will Smith has, has no that power. beautiful example of uh, skydiving. Mm. And he says, you know, when, when are you at the most fear when you're skydiving? It's when you're sitting in the airplane right. and when you're climbing up to altitude, that's when your fear is at the highest. And when you're sitting on the edge of the airplane and you're about to jump, that is when you're at the peak level of fear. Mm. Mm. And as soon as you jump and you start falling, that's when the excitement kicks in. All the fear mm. disappears and you just, you just have a great time. And he says, the fascinating thing about that is when you're sitting in the airplane is when you're safest. Mm. And when you're actually falling out of the sky is when the true danger is, but your fear is kicking in actually when you're safe. And so that was the same thing for me before I left my job. That's when I had the most fear, but that's when I was actually fine. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I jumped and then I had to create a business, I still had to make money. I still had to make this, this new business work. That's when I was most excited. The fear dissipated. I love that example. And I, I yeah. love the message in that because if we all sit back and think about it, that's exactly how fear happens almost every time. Yeah. Your fear is often grounded when you're most safe. Yeah. When you're sitting when on you're the couch. Safe, yeah. it, it becomes the excitement. And mm -hmm. it's almost like ironic that we as humans do this crap to ourselves. You know, one of, one of my guests, um, Chase Boringer, he was on just a few weeks ago. And one of the things he said, and he's kind of an adventure travel guy. He, he uh, travels all over the world. He guides these expeditions for people. And it started out as his, uh, has his own bucket list. And then he created a business out of this. And in the depths of his despair, and his was deep. I mean, like he was like, he had literally <laughs> said, okay, I'm going to go commit suicide, but I'm going to give myself five months to go do this stuff. And then I'm going to commit suicide. <laughs> wow. And it was very definitive. And in the midst of those depths, the thing that pulled him out was the day he woke up and he asked himself, what if I'm living my worst life right now? What if I'm living my worst right now? What else could I do? <laughs> and it's a really powerful question because if you're at your worst right now, it's kind of like, well, if you're at the bottom, where do you have to go? But if your worst life is happening right now, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose by taking another risk? <laughs> 
What do you have to lose by going and asking a question that you think might not get answered? What do you have to do by asking for help from someone that you're pretty sure you might get turned down? Well, you don't have anything else to lose. You're already there. And I think it's the same thing of the fear thing. It's like the fear is actually so grounded in something that doesn't exist most of the time. The only time I can think of true fear being something that truly exists is even standing, you know, in front of a car that's heading your way, but there's still the possibility you can get out of the way. And so much of this, and especially as a pilot, I mean, I think probably the only fear that can really exist is if you know the plane's going down, it's going down. Now there's still a possibility it could ride itself, but you know, there's at that moment that it will go down and there's nothing anybody can do, but there's always the moment that something could happen until again, it actually happens. And this is what I find fascinating about fear and people getting stuck in this stuff. So as you started moving forward, then here you are, you're done. You've come, you've, said, I'm done. I'm done doing the flying thing. But you knew there was something bigger than yourself. You knew you were moving this thing forward. When did it really dawn on you that this thing was the coaching, the creating these adventures, the moving things forward? When was like that inner moment you said, ah, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be called to do? Well, I'd always been interested in entrepreneurship as well. So I'd had a, a bunch of side businesses you know, while I was flying. So I was constantly looking for the answer you know, of what to do and I had a bad breakup. So we were all good stories to start from. Of course. And uh, after that, I happened to be following a coach online. I didn't even probably know that the word coach, but I was mm -hmm. following a personal development guy online. And after this breakup, he offered to uh, coach me, you know, mm -hmm. and help me through some stuff. We, we were chatting by email and through that you know he not only did he help me with the breakup he helped me get clear on what i wanted he helped me you know figure out what i wanted to do how i'd been being all these different things and he was traveling the world he was from canada but he was living in ojai and then he was living in bali and mm. i just remember thinking wow this this is what you do for a job you just get on the phone with people and you listen to them you inspire them and you help them create these cool lives and you just are traveling around the world and i'm paying you a lot of money and mm -hmm. wow this is amazing like i can't believe this is a job i think i finally found the business for me right uh so that was the moment i realized huh i think this is the intersection of my life you know of helping people of being gay of being authentic of entrepreneurship of travel it's all intersected in this business. That's, a, that's just so ironic to me because it's very, very parallel to my story. I had come out of the closet, gone through my divorce, was making my way, um, met my husband and lo and behold, I came back and those who've listened to this podcast know the story. I came back from vacation on a Monday morning, walked in and um, I was the third employee hired for this company. And they said, we love you. We think you're great, but we know you're the one guy in the company who will be just fine. And we have to let you go because we're needing to downsize. And um, I just remember thinking, okay, I'm not going to do this again, but I had been in, I had been involved with a couple of coaches at that point in time. So this is late 90, uh, late nineties is when I first met a coach and then had somebody in my life um, coaching me at one point. And I was really fascinated by it. And then this event happened in 2006 and I'm like, okay, I'm done doing this. And I didn't know, you know, that that was going to be my path, but that was one of the first thing that crossed my mind was I need to get a coach. I didn't need to get a counselor to help me with, you know, figuring out my next work move. I didn't need, I wanted to get this coach and I wanted to figure this out. And I'm so glad I did because that was the opening door. And I know that door, the first door that opened was I came out <laughs> And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to endure painful, you know, work experiences for a little while longer. And then that door opened and said, are you ready to take the hint? You're not supposed to be doing this. And then I did a little bit of consulting and then that door opened and said, you're really miserable doing this marketing and branding consulting. So do you want to take the hint yet? And it was just so interesting because it was each doorway was like, we're waiting for you. The universe is like saying, we're waiting for you to step through and just keep stepping through. And I love that this is what I'm hearing really from you too. It's like the doors kept opening and opening and opening saying, are you paying attention? And as you started to pay attention, what was the greatest gift you received from really putting your attention where you were being led? Mm. It was realizing that I can create something unique. Mm. 
I'm unique. Nobody's ever had the life that I've had. There's, mm. you know, there's never been a gay pilot from New Zealand that became a life coach. I'm pretty sure I can't verify that, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I'm the first person to do that. And so by following those little things, you realize that, wow, through your uniqueness, you can create something unique for the world. You, know, mm. you can, the intersection of all your gifts can create something unique for people and for the world. And yeah, keeping to, moving towards those things, you know, like last year I created the, this adventure series. So mm-hmm. I went, wow, you know, I've been traveling my whole life as a pilot. I know travel. I know how to do different countries. I know what's exciting. I know the logistics and I know the transformational power of travel. Mm-hmm. And what if I could combine that with coaching? What if I could mm-hmm. bring people on adventures, give them a, a story they'll tell for the rest of their life yep. and connect with a bunch of cool people and then maybe transform in the process. And just kind of letting that sit in because I know so many of my listeners have heard so many different stories about this, but I don't think anybody's ever put it quite in that lens of through your own uniqueness, you can create something unique for the world. And I've held to that in my own heart in many ways, because I'm like, it's a unique perspective that I came out late in life. I had kids. I had a wife. Okay, that's not, none of that is really unique. But then when I started to say, but I'm going to help guys who are coming out late in life. Now I started to be a little bit unique when I put my foot down and said, absolutely. I'm not going to coach other people because I got the, Oh, you can help teens. And no, nope, I can't because I didn't have that experience. What I had was the experiences. I was a li- lovely little blooming late bloomer. And that's where I want to stay my focus. And that's when I started to realize my uniqueness was my experience that I could make something beautiful of. And that's when I latched onto it. But you're the first person, literally, man, in all the years that I've had conversations, like you summed it up in that one sentence. I want to say it again, through the uniqueness, your own uniqueness, you can create something unique for the world. And so many people miss this piece. In fact, I have a client right now who's struggling with this piece and I can't wait to talk to him this afternoon. <laughs> because I'm like, <laughs> okay, I, I figured this out, man. Well, I didn't, I'm going to say, you know, here, you need to hear what Nathan said on the podcast today, but. Well, it's also that the the trick is we can't see it for ourselves, right? No, we we can't. We need coaches to show our our unique pieces. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So as you saw this unique piece, what was the first thing you feel like you did that you just really leveraged your uniqueness and said, here, this is what I'm going to go do. Was it the adventure stuff? Was it, I mean, coaching wasn't unique, but it was probably unique to you and how you did it. But what was that standout thing that you feel like you started bringing to the world? Mm, look, it's so messy. I mean, you know, I can try and summarize it in a beautiful little phrase on a podcast, right. but you know, we're talking about years of trying and failing and me being stuck in fear and not wanting to do that. Um, but really it was, it was, you know, I saw the unique things about, uh, I, I call myself a professional dreamer mm. uh, because, you know, I dreamed of being a pilot since I was eight years old. And after that, I dreamed of traveling the world and I dreamed of becoming a coach. And I just can't not dream. Like I love coming up with impossible dreams and then going mm-hmm. after them. So I call myself a professional dreamer. So I saw that that was pretty unique. I saw the authenticity piece around being gay and, and the way I lived my life so authentically was unique. Um, and then people kept reflecting to me how much courage I had in different mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. So I saw those three elements, authenticity, dreaming, and courage, and went, huh. I think I can really help people with those three things. I love the simplicity of this because again, this is where I think many people come to these moments in life. It's like, okay, I'm going to do something. I want to change. And then they throw a a whole pile of shit on getting it done. (laughs) And it doesn't have to be that complicated. It can be, we can put a lot of complications in any of this stuff, but the way you just said it is like, okay, I'm a dreamer, uh, authentic and courage. These are my things. And it's so simple. And I think most people miss this. If you really want to do something, it really doesn't have to be super complicated. It probably feels it, but I think the big question would be, does it have to be complicated? How can I do this as simple as possible? And I think that's probably because you do practice some minimalism and that probably helps support the way you think and the way you do things, I would believe. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, there's beauty and simplicity. It's hard to be simple. Mm -hmm. There's beauty in it. Uh, yeah, minimalism for me has been, you know, I was into minimalism before it was cool, Rick, you know, mm-hmm. now it's, it's very cool, but I was into it like 10 years ago. 
Yeah. And, thank, you, thank you, Marie Kondo. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the thing that attracted me to it was not about getting rid of stuff, but that minimal, minimalism was about removing all the things in your life uh, and focusing on just the things that brought you joy. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't just about physical things. It was about, you know, I remember one of the exercises I did early on was I had to write a list of all the people in my life, all the people I interacted with in a week. And then, you know, grade them from priority, like one, two or three. Is it you know, these top priority? Are these just friends or are these just acquaintances? Mm-hmm. And then the uncomfortable piece was how much time do I spend with each of these people? Mm-hmm. And I realized that I spent way too much time with, you know, going for coffee with people from work or, you know, and they're all lovely people. But in the sure. big scheme, I was neglecting the people that I said were the highest priority. Mm-hmm. And so minimalism goes well you know create the space get rid of those things that are uh, superfluous so you can focus mm-hmm. on what's really important mm-hmm. and and just uh, as you said that it just struck me because i'm going through something personally right now around that but mm. i think we can also spend too much time with the people that don't bring us joy trying to make that person somehow fit the joy we want from them when mm. They're never going to be able to do that do that for us. Mm. It's such a it's an interesting exploration when you stand back and go, okay, is this person bringing me the kind of joy I want? And of course, you have to ask yourself, are you causing them not to bring the joy? But but then when you finally kind of step into it and go, okay, this person doesn't bring me a lot of joy, but I'm trying and trying and trying and trying to keep them in my life because for some reason I think they will finally bring that joy. And when we realize they won't, then let it go. And that may sound like very easy to just throw off. And I'm not saying that to anybody who's listening right now, but I would invite you to go there and go, how much time are you spending with the people that don't bring you joy simply in the hopes that they might? Because if you are, you're actually really wasting your time and you could put that into such better relationships. And I know you were going to say something about in business. It's, it's very similar. I would assume there's lots of, we put too much effort and time into stuff and then suddenly we're junked up. And so go ahead and finish that thought, Nathan. Yeah. Well, you, you just uh, triggered another thought for me around that. Uh, you know, Brene Brown has this beautiful definition of connection, which is that, you know, both people feel seen, heard and valued from the relationship. Uh, both people can share free of judgment and both people receive strength and sustenance from the relationship. Mm-hmm. And, what you just said, you know, if you've got someone in your life that's challenging you in that way, running it through those three things and just seeing where the connection is missing. Am I not feeling seen, heard or valued? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I feel seen, heard and valued. Am I not, am I able to communicate free of judgment? You know, that, that might be one with our parents that gets in the way a lot, you know, and the third one, do I receive strength and sustenance from the relationship? And that kind of speaks to the joy piece you were talking Mm -hmm. about do I actually gain strength? Does this fill me up this relationship? Is this something that I look forward to speaking to this person on the phone? Because I know I'm going to get something that fills me up. Mm-hmm. Um, that was just there for me when you said that, because it's, it's been such a good lens for me to look at my, my friendships and relationships and see what's missing. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought it up because I, I remember Renee Brown talking about those things, but again, it's very simple. Do you feel seen, heard, <laughs> Are you able to communicate without the judgment? And, and does this bring you some strength? Does this bring this you, this piece of happiness? And again, it's so simple. It's very simple in the approach. But as a business person, and I know you are, and we both are, and there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are entrepreneurs or people who are in the shift of you know doing these things. I often think we forget to look at our businesses in the same way. Am I allowing my business to be seen, heard, and valued? Am I looking at my business through a lens of not so much judgment? Am I allowing my business to be something of strength that gives me joy? And when we don't look at our businesses or we don't look at the quest for entrepreneurship or solopreneur, whatever we want to, whatever one of the catchwords we want to put on this without some of the, with those lenses, we tend to just, okay, today I wake up, I got to get this done, da, 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 da. and then at the end of the day, we're like, in fact, Jonathan Phil is one of my friends from Good Life Project. Um, he has a, that beautiful podcast. He said, if your business isn't bringing you joy, it's time for a new business. And I think it's really true. Mm. I think it plays to what you and I have been talking about. 
And I don't know if anybody really grasps the simplicity again of those words. If something isn't bringing you joy, maybe, you know, again, thank you, Marie, God, <laughs> so to speak right now. But if it's not bringing you joy, why do you do it? Why do you allow it in your life? Why do you let this be where you are? And I didn't get to this, but I think it'd be worth touching on it because I know actually the reason that you and I got connected, I still remember it. It was, you know, I had been following you for a while on Instagram and everything. And then the day that you posted about your one year sobriety was the day that I'm like, I want to reach out to this guy. Mm. And how did that piece of your life begin to bring you even more joy? Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. I do uh, 90 days off alcohol every year just to make sure I can. I do. I do 90 days off alcohol, coffee, social media, and porn. Mm. I just kind of do all four. I just knock them all off in one hit. <laughs> and I uh, do that for 90 days a year. And I got to the 90 day mark with alcohol and just thought, well, is going drinking again, is that going to, what's that going to do? Mm. And uh, it didn't excite me. And I thought, well, I wonder if I can keep going. Mm. What would four months look like? What would six months look like? What would nine months look like? What would a year look like? And, you know, I'm a coach, so I'm always looking through the lens of growth. Yep. And there just felt like a tremendous amount of growth there. Social engagements felt really uncomfortable when I was sober. Mm. Uh, when I finished a hard day, not being able to numb that with alcohol felt difficult. And so I was like, huh, well, there's obviously something to look at here. Yep. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of growth that came out of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting to me because I've been somewhat in a similar space. I don't drink a lot these days. I enjoy my wine. Um, typically drink a good amount of wine on the weekends, but we, my husband and I pretty much try not to drink at all during the week, you know, come Monday through Thursday, sometimes even Sunday through Thursday, we just like, okay, we're done. We're good. What I found so interesting is my own perspective on somebody who really talks about all the drinks and stuff they have. Because then I see my judgment showing up, but then I also see the reverse and we belong, we have a um, meetup group that we run here in our local town. And so we do lots of different things. One of them is a wine Wednesday that we do. And I'm always fascinated by the group when somebody comes to the wine Wednesday and they show up and they say, Oh no, I don't drink. I just wanted to be here. Hmm. And it's almost like you can just kind of see <laughs> Well, you can see the reactions from people like, okay, like, well, what the fuck are you doing here? This is, you know, and it's like, they obviously are pretty genuine. They're obviously very authentic. They know who they are. They don't need this. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anybody who does drink is wrong because I drink, but I've always find it really interesting to sit in that observation place and watch how people react because it's almost like, well, you don't belong back to our <laughs> whole conversation earlier about belonging mm. yet really it takes drinking a glass of wine or a cocktail or a beer or something to make you feel as if you belong, which to me is actually why a lot of addictions begin to happen. Every one of us feels like we have to belong, whether it's social media, wine, alcohol, drugs, sex, porn, whatever it is. And then we suddenly wake up one day, a lot of us, and go, what joy is this really bringing me? And it sounds like that's exactly what happened for you. This was, it doesn't sound like it was like, oh, you're screwed up. It was, I'm doing my 90 day thing and let's just see what continues to happen. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm from New Zealand, so we have a lot of good wine down here. So I was mm -hmm. brought up drinking wine. But I, I do, you know, I would have a glass of wine making dinner and then... Mm -hmm another glass of wine serving dinner and then I'd finish the bottle over dinner and mm -hmm. you know that was a Monday yep so <laughs> I kind of it never impacted me I it didn't impact me financially it didn't ever stop my work it didn't I didn't right. ever hide it so you know an addiction in that way is hard to define I've noticed mm -hmm. um, and I had no problem stopping yep. um, but it was something that I thought huh I do do this without thinking a lot of the time Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I get to the end of the day and I open a bottle of wine and it's, it's become a bit of a habit. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to just test that. Mm. 
And yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head, you know, like trying to go to a wedding and not drink, trying to go to a family, trying to go through Christmas and not drink, mm, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the judgment from your family and, and just trying to get you to drink or come around. It was, it was really fascinating to see well, that. I think it's fascinating too, because if we put this lens on anything, I mean, I have friends who are vegetarians and people, you know, I never really saw that condescendence, so to speak. Mm. Until I really started observing this in the group. And I thought, this is so fascinating because, wow, these people, you know, everybody gets judged for things that are actually not that big a deal. And then it brought me back to, you know, of course, pure judgment and then looking at myself going, okay, well, what kind, what kind of shade am I throwing at people over stuff? And, and it makes you stop and think. You know, it really makes you stop and think. So, uh, Well, I think you want to be the supporter. You know, like I, I remember – when people would do that and I was sort of six or nine months in, I just remember thinking, you could never do this. You know, mm-hmm. do you have any idea how hard this is to go a year without yes. drinking in, in a, a drinking culture, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. I think if anything, be the supporter of someone's choosing not to drink or give up sugar or go vegetarian or whatever it is, be the one that goes, Hey man, I get how hard that is. And you know, I'll do, I'll do whatever I'm, I can to support you. I'm laughing because a friend of mine just came off of being off of social media for like a month. <laughs> and um, I remember one of the first things that happened, she posted, okay, I'm back. And somebody said, I have been trying to find you. I cannot find you anywhere. And it happened to be somebody who lives in her own hometown. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, they're, they're, I wouldn't call them friends, but they're friends enough to be acquaintances. And I was laughing so hard. It's like, if you really wanted to go find her, I think you could have gone to her house. Yeah, knock on the door. It, yeah, knock on the door. <laughs> but it, it was just so funny because it makes you realize as humans how much we start to put importance on certain things as the way of connection. And we sometimes forget, how did we do all this before that? You know, how did we do it before cell phones? How did we do it before... You know, how do we find our way across the world without map? You know, all this sort of stuff. It's just, it's very fascinating. And then suddenly you come back to, oh yeah, we were regular evolving humans. And 40 years ago, we were regular evolving humans from 40 years before that. And 40, you know, it's just, it's fascinating to watch this whole thing. So uh, how do you manage that? Just out of interest, it's a curiosity for me when I talk to people, how do you manage your social media and your phone and stuff like that? For me personally? Yeah. Um, is it something you have to think about or no, not really because I pretty much put the phone down at whatever time I leave my desk in the evening. Um, I, I just pretty much it's, it's available because I have kids, but I don't really get involved with it that much. Um, I will say that if I wake up in the middle of the night, I will get on my iPad cause I either read or I listen to an audible book. Um, if I'm really not sleeping and I'm like, feel that full awakeness, <laughs> I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's read email right now because I don't want to read it first thing in the morning. So I'll get involved. But for me, it's not that difficult. Um, most, my phone is always on silent. So I will not, I never, nobody ever hears a ringtone out of my phone. Um, I'm pretty much the kind of guy who's like, if I need to be contacted or whatever, I look at my phone every so often. Um, Facebook isn't really like it used to be a biggie for me. Like, Oh my God, I got to check and check, check. Now I know it's just a means for me communicating things to people. So it's not as prevalent. I try to only be on Facebook a couple of times a day. Um, one time a day I need to be on simply because <laughs> I got to do some business stuff there. Um, Instagram I love, but it's more for, I'm more curious about the world and I'm curious about sharing stuff. But again, I'll, I'll hop on a couple of times a day, share things. Most of it's all managed through from a business perspective, it's all managed with tools. I mean, I, before we even got on here today, I was, you know, doing stuff that's all managed through, you know, auto posting tools and all that stuff. But I don't want to rely just on that because that loses the connection too, mm. you know? So it's, it's an interesting mix. Um, yeah. I'm curious, I had to I lose it. It's an art form. Huh? Yeah, it is an art <laughs> form. Totally. It totally is. I, my husband and I were on a cruise a few well, a couple of months ago, right around Thanksgiving time here in the United States. And um, we were probably three, four days uh, on the cruise before we had social media available to us. And then even when we were in ports, 
we didn't go rushing to try to find somewhere to connect up. If we happened to go to somewhere to have a drink or something that had Wi-Fi, we'd connect up. But it was so amazing to know, hey, we only got limited time, so what are we going to use this for? It wasn't for social media. Yeah, we posted a few things along the way, but it was more important when we were able to connect to something. It was, let's connect, let's call the kids, let's, you know, let's touch base with the people that are most important to us. Mm. And I think it's an interesting question. One of my girlfriends said to me the other day, she goes, if we answered the question, if you could only use your social media to connect with the people that are most important to you, how much would you use it? I thought that was a really interesting question. Mm. Cause it does make a, a pretty big question there of who, okay. <laughs> so who would it be? You know, uh, yeah. very interesting stuff. Comes back to the important people. Exactly. So as we wrap up here, man, and I so appreciate this conversation today. You and I could probably Likewise. talk all day, but um, I'm curious for you having stepped forward and realized this is your path. And for somebody who is like, I not, I want to do this. I want to be on my path. I want to go just trust where I'm going is where I'm going. Um, what would you encourage them to do? I know that's a big question, but like one last nugget of wisdom that, you know, they know they want to go do this, but they're not doing it. It's in the core of them. Like, you know, flying was in the core of you. I still see you just as this guy who's flying. And this is this guy who's flying through his, you know, coaching, his adventure, what he's creating with his groups and stuff. What would you encourage someone to do who they just know it's so deep in themselves, but they're just not getting there. Get a coach. <laughs> Stop trying to do it on your own. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had coaches all along the way. And uh, when I didn't feel it and when I felt the fear and when I forgot who I was, my coach didn't forget. Mm -hmm. My coach was there speaking to my higher self, holding the vision that he and she knew that I wanted and uh, believed in me no matter what, no matter what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. So stop trying to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. I think I'll tag on to that, um, Nathan, that I'm glad you brought up that highest self and encourage anybody who's struggling right now to figure out what is next, figure out what your highest self is. Because if you don't know that, I hate to tell you this, the struggle is going to be even bigger. The moment you get to know your highest self, to know your true self, to know your authentic self and to stand in that power in front of whatever obstacles come your way, whether they be human material, whatever they may be. But if you know your highest self and your most authentic self, the work will be so much more easy to do because you're honoring yourself. You're coming out of your closet. You're living life on your bold terms and living much closer to what it means for you to authentically live your life your way. So thanks again for being here, bro. Totally appreciate thank you, man. A pleasure. And thank you for everything you do in the world. All right, there you have it. Another episode of Life on Closet has come to an end, but that's okay. We're going to be back in just a couple of days sharing more stories, tips, tricks, and wisdom for helping you live your life on closet. And you know what? You can share it too. Just take a few moments if you like and if you believe in this podcast and share it with someone you know today. Share it from your phone. Go share it on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you are. Maybe even give us a rating review because you know what? It's all about the planet living their life on closet. I'm Rick Clemens, host of the show and the guy who helps you make those big, bold moves. And I hope you never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your life uncloseted. Catch you real soon. Take care, everyone.